Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Alex Perlman. Uh, I am a, a research affiliate at the MIT Community Bio Initiative, um, while also simultaneously being an editor at Biodesign Magazine and also um, a researcher at the University of Pennsylvania um, working on ethics and community bio. So that's what I do. Um, we have a great lineup of people who are going to talk about all the things that I find very interesting um, and hopefully you do too, but we're going to start off with um, a little housekeeping. So I'm just going to share my screen and uh, we'll go through a couple of slides here. So this is the bioethics, biosafety, biosecurity track. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, so if you could please rename yourselves according to this naming convention of name, pronouns, affiliation, and where you're from, um, that would be great. Also remember to mute your sound. Um, and I also want to note that this session is going to be recorded. So while we would love for you to have your camera on and like, please do that if you can um, and feel like you want to. Um, it's really great to just be able to see everyone's faces and these sessions are going to be heavily discussion based. But if you do not want to be recorded or if you cannot um, show your face for whatever reason, then feel free leaving your camera off. Um, the chat is also super active. I'm sure you guys have seen me and my fellow organizers in a bunch of other sessions using the chat um, with no regard <laughs> to um, clogging it. So feel free to use it because all of that gets saved. So all of that conversation is also being recorded. So, um, you know, don't worry about going too fast or clogging the chat. Like, please clog it. Say what you want. Um, with that said, uh, also make sure that um, we're using Google Docs um, and Slack. So you can find in the participant drive that there is um, a folder for this track and a folder for the upcoming session on biosafety and the handbook. Um, and you can find the links to all of that via um, biosummit.live, which is our main website. And as always, um, we want to be very conscious about safety and um, friendliness. So if there are any um, code of conduct violations that you see um, or that you feel yourself or witness, please email us. You can find us on Slack. Anyone with a red background, you can message us privately or you can email the uh, Gmail. Uh, it goes to all of us, the biosummit.org email. Um, so that said, Oh, and also thank you to our sponsors. We wouldn't be here without them. So, okay, moving on to, uh, oops, wrong slide. Introducing the Biosafety Handbook. Um, I wanna just make sure that everyone is here, but um, I, I can't see all the speakers because I have the shared screen on. But um, hopefully everyone is here except for Jenny, who I think was running late, but, um, so we have a great group of folks who uh, I have known for a few years in some cases, but all of them have known each other for way more years than that and way more years than I've known any of them. And they have been working on this project for a very long time. And I think it's really important because not only um, have all of these folks been around since sort of the early days of this movement, um, they have all been working really, really hard to uh, make sure that the community bio as it evolves and grows continues to maintain the rigorous safety standards that I think have always been set out. So all of these folks are sort of um, have been heavily involved in that. And so um, we'll hear from them about their project, but I just like to personally thank them for doing that work. Um, and I think that what they do is incredible and very valuable and very much appreciated by um, so many people who are in the movement, love the movement, and, um, you know, this is one of our, you know, most important documents to date. This is like a historical moment, so it's very important, and thank you so much, you guys, for taking this on, and everyone else who was affiliated with this project. Um, so Todd, Dan, Jenny, Eric, Angela, and Patrick, I'm going to turn it over to you, um, and you guys can tell a little bit about yourselves, and then we can talk a little bit about the project, and, um, Amanda's gonna be keeping time. Desiree is here if we have any pro problems. Um, and other than that, 
thank you very much. Who wants to go first? Why don't, why don't you start? <laughs> Um, all right, well, so hey, everybody, thank you for, um, for coming. Um, I'm, happily, I'm happy to say that I lost our bet of how many people would be here. Um, I, I went low, but so I'm thrilled to see how many people I, uh, showed up for this. So thank you for that. Um, just quickly about myself, um, I've been involved with the community from the, from the early stages, I would say, when I worked at the Wilson Center in Washington. And this has been a sort of evolving project over the last 10, 12 years around issues around safety, ethics, responsibility. So I'm really thrilled that we've gotten to this point. Um, I'm currently at North Carolina State University, although literally currently I'm in Washington, DC, and they've just started tearing up the road outside of my apartment. So if it gets loud, let me know and I'll hand it over. But um, that's a little bit um, about me um, and I'll turn it over to whoever wants to go next. I'll go next. Uh, my name is Dan Grushkin. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of GenSpace, which is one of the first community biology labs, um, and also the founder of the Biodesign Challenge. Uh, Todd and I and a lot of the people in this room have been working together for the last 12 years on trying to create uh, shared sets of ethics and shared sets of safety standards within this community. Uh, long before the community was ever this big. And um, I'm very excited for this moment because I, I, I agree with Alex Perlman in that this really is a historic moment that we put this, this document together. So I guess I'll go next. Uh, my name is Eric Kearns. I'm the former president of BioCurious. Uh, I've been around the biohacking you know, community science um, whatever you want to call it, citizen science movement, uh, since it really began out in California. I bounce around a little bit. Um, now here with you guys, excited to see this thing finally get put together and put out. So I hope you guys enjoy the presentation and I'll throw it over to Patrick. For a little introduction. All right. So my, my name is Patrick Dasler. Um, I actually originally started at BioCurious before I went off and founded Counterculture Labs in Oakland. Uh, and I'm one of those people that did not grow up in a lab like, unlike some of the other people here. Uh, so I was one of the troublemakers at BioCurious because I knew a good amount about biology, but I had never actually worked in a lab before. So they wind up saying, fine, you figure out how to do this safely. And they put me on the safety committee. Um, so I, I have a very different perspective in terms of like having to have to read through all the manuals myself and sort of figure things out from scratch. And, you know, it's a useful sort of slightly at an angle perspective from some of the, um, the folks that actually did come through the whole lab system. So, Angela, do you want to take next? Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Um, I'm Angela and I actually have a background in academic labs and worked in museums um, before coming to GenSpace as um, one of the first ever biosafety fellows um, through the, the project that uh, uh, Todd and Dan talked about this morning. Um, so I spent my, my first year at GenSpace um, learning everything about community biology labs and um, DIY bio and managing the lab there. And then I stayed on to become the director of operations for this last year. Um, at GenSpace and, and so really, really dove deep into um, the community biology world and, and love it. And I'm also excited about this manual that we've uh, put together and excited to share with, with you today. Uh, Jenny can't be with us until about 2.30 or so, so um, I guess Todd, you could go next. All right, so um, let me pull up. We have a couple of slides just to help us keep our heads straight. Um, so let me. And we should mention that sort of the the seventh member of this collective that isn't here at the moment is uh, David Gillum. Yeah. Who's actually uh, with APSA, which is the main uh, bi safety organization here in the US and actually internationally as well. Yeah, and, and that's a really important um, piece to this too. So, you know, as we've said, you know, this has been a, 
a project in the making for many years. It's kind of evolved over, as the community has evolved in terms of the, the needs of the of the community. And one of the partners DIY Bio has had for quite a while now is the American Biological Safety Officers Association, which is now the international something something something. But it's it's basically the the an organization of biosafety officers. Um, so officers that you would find in companies, in universities, in governments and the like. And they have really been a really good partner over the last number of years. Um, as I mentioned this morning, they were the people answering the questions that were coming through the Ask a Biosafety Officer portal when that was up and running and active. Um, they developed the, the biosafety boot camp for us that we offered last summer. Um, and David Gillum, who's actually, who's the president of ABSA, um, served as sort of our like check to make sure that the information we were putting in this manual was was actually correct. Um, and they have um, expressed interest to continue to partner with us moving forward um, as we continue to to update this manual and hopefully continue to be able to offer sort of these different types of, of training programs um, that we think were, were useful. Um, I also want to um, thank our the Open Philanthropy Project, who is really the ones who were enabled this to happen, um, able, or enabled us to hire folks like Angela to test out that type of program. It enabled Dan and I to travel around and visit with all of you over the last two years to gather the type of information that you thought would be useful um, in a manual like this. Um, and so I really want to thank them for um, putting their faith in this community and recognizing the value of this community um, to be able to support um, an activity like this. So what we thought we would do today is is to start um, is to start with the manual. Um, it's here, like we said, it's here, it's yours. Um, and so we want to kind of go through it and, and talk a little bit about our thinking of why things are in there um, and how we came about this as if you've had a chance to take a look at it, it's long, <laughs> um, but, um, there's, but there is a lot of really good information in there and it's really not meant to be read page cover to cover. I hope no one ever does that. Um, but you know, we've, we've done our best to try to incorporate everything we think that is useful. Um, but now we're at the stage where we want all of your inputs to at first put thing, find things that we've missed, um, but also to help us adapt it to your individual needs. Um, as I think I mentioned this morning, and, and this is why it's so great to have Patrick on this as one of the authors, is because a lot of these sort of, you know, if you want to call them rules or regulations or even, you know, best practices um, need to be adapted um, to your unique circumstances and the types of labs that you have. And we've attempted to do that, but this is where we now need the community to help us continue to do that to make sure that we're capturing everything you need. And maybe mo most importantly, particularly where, where you're coming from. So as you probably know, the laws, regulations, and rules vary immensely from country to country. And so this is where we need you to help us update this based on particular locations where you are. Um, so I'm going to now turn it over to Angela, who's going to start going through the various sort of chapters um, on what's actually in the manual. Um, and then after that, we're going to break out into some working groups to actually get some work done to figure out how we make this thing live on um, after today. So Angela, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Todd. Um, yeah, so we, what, as Todd said, what we're gonna do next is just kind of guide you through like the table of contents and tell you a little bit about what to expect to find in this manual. Um, I wanted to just kind of first say that like how we got to this table of contents, how we got to this list is we spent a lot of time reviewing um, lab manuals that were already out there. So, you know, lots of community labs have already put one out there. If you have and it's available on your website, we, we definitely reviewed it. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at academic lab manuals because as you know, most institutions have an environmental health and safety office and they publish lots of different lab manuals. Um, the government agencies and um, national societies have manuals, you know, CDC, the NIH, the AMS, ACS, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, there's lots and lots of materials out there. And so we reviewed everything and, and tried to kind of pull together what we thought made sense for the community biology labs. Um, and, you know, as, as Todd mentioned, there's, it's possible that there are things that, that are just not here, but we, we, we worked together to prioritize what we thought um, should go in it. We also wrote this with recommendations. So there's nowhere in here that we're going to say <laughs> you must do things a certain way. It's all, it's all uh, recommendations that um, we put together. Um, and then uh, also I just want to say that, you know, this is uh, coming from primarily pr uh, the perspectives, and especially in this first chapter, um, perspectives from uh, GenSpace, BioMakeSpace, Counterculture Labs, and BioCurious. And so, um, you know, we, we used all of our, our, the information that we had and, and, and tried to share what, what we know. Um, and obviously these are not the only perspectives, and we, we do hope that um, folks will, will sign on to, to contribute in ways in the future. So the first chapter um, is uh, laboratory management practices. So we think that how an organization is, is, is structured and, and managed, um, you know, will, will sort of influence how, how safe a uh, space is run. Um, and so we just gave examples of, of different types of, of organizational structures that one um, community labs might have. Um, we put things in there like how to vet projects and how to, um, you know, make policies around ordering supplies and storing supplies. Um, we gave uh, examples of, of youth policies and guest policies, and we put uh, links to um, all of these different types of policies or, or um, contracts or any, any sort of resources that we felt would be useful um, are in that chapter and just lots of recommendations on, on how, how one might run a space. Um, the next chapter is laboratory infrastructure and design. And so this is, includes everything from, if you're just looking to set up a lab in a city, what, what are the things you should be on the lookout for? Who are the people you should be contacting? Um, and then it also covers things like, what is the specific lab? Which, what sort of materials would, do, would you want to use? What sort of signage should your lab have? Um, and that, what, what that chapter infrastructure and design is about. Um, the basics and what members should know chapter is something that probably a lot of, of labs um, already have uh, as part of their uh, orientating um, for new members. So lots of do's and don'ts of like what sort of clothing, um, what sort of lab etiquette um, is appropriate in, in the space. Um, you know, policies on working alone in the lab, that, that sort of thing is, is covered in, in the basics chapter. We have a chapter on codes of conduct, human subjects, and data protection. Um, I actually worked maybe the least on this, on this chapter my, myself, um, but uh, I know that a lot of labs are interested in working um, with human subjects, and so there's, there's information uh, uh, in there um, that I know probably needs some, some expansion on, on IRBs. Um, the UK also has some specific rules around data protection and that um, stuff was, was covered in theirs. And so there's, you know, the examples that, you know, we, we tried to cover as much as we could with the knowledge that we had, um, but there's going to be many uh, places that are going to need additional information from, from other labs. Um, so I will now hand it over to Eric, who's going to talk about the following chapters. Great. Thanks, Angela. Uh, yeah, I think one of the most things we focused on was deconvoluting all the technical language and making it really, really understandable for people who are novices or just entering this. So, you know, resuming with chapter six, we went into emergency procedures, and these are things that a lot of times you don't think about when you get into a laboratory. A lot of people are really excited, but, you know, what if there is a fire? Um, how do you post your emergency contact details? Where is the general emergency plan documents at? Um, so we're sort of setting up this infrastructure for you to handle chemical spills, um, you know, talk about emergency first aid, what do you do in the case of biological spills, and then you know, creating these, these plans and kits and then breaking that down for some of the best practices. Oh, you know, where did BioCurious get their materials for the kit? Or where did counterculture get their materials for the kit? Well, I don't have that. So what your contribution we would hope would be to help us fill out this manual to make it even fuller so we know where to do that in the work country. Um, and then getting inside of some of the other lab emergencies, like what happens when you're minus 20 or minus 
AD goes down? Um, what about a major equipment failure? Um, what sort of emergency communications do you have before, during, and after emergency? How do you handle the media that comes to your building when they find out you've had a fire or there's been an incident? Um, and then what sort of debriefing do you actually do afterwards? You know, how do you talk to your community and how do you talk amongst yourselves in a leadership role? Um, we went on from there into chapter seven into biological risk assessments for PD laboratories. And this is something we've talked a lot about um, at Bio Summits in the past. So David Gillum went out and filled this section out and gave us more detail about how they look at bio-risk assessments. And then we took that information and we said, well, David, that's a little bit too technical and we want to work on that and make it so we understand it and we can sort of identify this for our community and give it to them as a resource. So um, we stepped through this logically in identifying the biological risks, determining sort of the risk groups and then the considerations for how you're actually going to contain and use that activity. So uh, anyone managing a laboratory issue definitely look at this um, for their community. And then we get into sort of the day-to-day -day, um, personal protective equipment in the laboratory. What is the function of the lab coat? What are the features? What are the styles? Why would you want to use one? Um, what are some of the other PPP, PPE you have? Eye protection, um, why do you need it? What type do you need? Um, you know, overcoming some of the excuse, excuses people use not to wear eye protection or safety glasses, and then some of the maintenance. And then always a question or concern about gloves and what kind of gloves you wear. Um, we get into a lot of that about PPE and what types are best for certain applications. We have selection charts in there as well. Um, so protection, and then um, one of the things we, wanted to definitely focus on as well as talk about equipment usage and safety. Um, one side of it is protecting the novice from dangerous equipment, which has pinch points or can fling really heavy rotors through walls. Um, we wanted to make sure they were aware of what the dangers were and what the general safety was, but we also want to make sure you protect that investment. You know, a lot of times community labs don't have the ability to buy new pieces of equipment. Um, a lot of these are donations. So we wanted to make sure we had general things and we wanted to have specific concerns about um, what type of lab equipment and what things you look for. And then we also get into the risk of acquiring used equipment. A lot of times used equipment is dumped onto a community lab and you need to make sure it, one, it's safe and not contaminated and how do you go about the process of decontamination of equipment as well. Um, we get into um, things about making your own equipment, which has become a really hot topic in um, the DIY sense to make our own equipment and provide for ourselves and you know, make it affordable and um, make it robust. But there's also safety concerns in there as well about, um, you know, is it, Poorly constructed, is it well constructed, will it do the job and will it be safe? So we get into a bunch of those and give you safety re resources, and then we point to good and bad designs as well. Um, I think one of the perennial topics in um, any safety manual or any safety training is chemical safety. Chem chemical safety is something that always comes up with new members who don't know what a lot of these chemicals do, what they're for, and then also how to read labels how to understand um, what sorts of hazards are being communicated by a label. Um, so we dive into some of that and we try to make it as global as possible where we use the GHS system, which is a global harmonized system for chemical safety and identification. And we sort of go through and explain uh, more about the chemicals you've been working with. And then also chemical whitelist that you might want to look at that um, should be safe for every lab environment to use. Um, we also get into why you'd want to use a fume hood with certain chemicals and why you wouldn't. And um, a lot of people talk in commercial labs about safe alternatives, green chemistry, instead of using carcinogens, maybe we can think about other chemicals that do the same work um, or work about the same. Um, we list some of that. Um, and then disposing of these chemicals as well. 
a lot of times um, it's very hard to find the details about how you go through disposal of chemical waste, how do you label it, um, how does the pickups work, who do I contact. Um, so we use some of the materials and resources that we've gathered in our experience and provided those for you. And then um, finally, uh, we get into acquiring, shipping, and transporting materials, and then um, into some of the biological safety. So into some of that safety um, around um, recombinant uh, technologies where you can get into um, uh, some of the things from NIH and some of the confusion about what is recombinant. Um, can you release this GMO? What do they say about um, uh, these organisms in different countries or transferring those? And that's why we're, we also get into a chapter on acquiring and shipping transporting materials, which can get you into a whole heck of a lot of hot water if you do this improperly um, uh, by, you know, either mislabeling it, misrepresenting it, uh, hand carrying it, and we give you advice about how to do these things properly and how to follow the rules on uh, shipping and transporting materials. So, um, Jenny, if you're here, I will pass it over to you. Okay, she might still be busy. Yeah, I think she might be in her other it's still in the other meeting. She, Jenny said, uh, yeah, she's in open innovation right now. Okay, no problem. Um, so just to get a little bit more detail into some of the other things that we get into, um, one of the problems we had people coming to us with um, was the waste management side. A lot of people, I mean, Jen's page came to BioCurious and said, how do you guys do this? And me and Dan had a great conversation about, oh, this is how we handle these things. And what we, we hope we can get from a community from you guys themselves is how do you guys handle this? What do you do? Who are the vendors? Who are the people? How do you control from this waste? And if you don't know, leverage the resources we have um, and help us figure out how to um, share this information to everyone. Um, there is also guidance on um, dealing with people that might be handling them improperly. Um, and how to talk to people about those things. Um, we also get into the sort of waste classification system that they use in waste management. And then almost every lab I know of that's a community lab is a very small quantity generator in the US. The UK has different definitions as well as worldwide. Um, and then going back, um, we also get into some of the um, infectious and non-infectious uh, disease shipping. I know a lot of people have talked about COVID and what they can and cannot do. Um, we cover a lot of that in our uh, manual as well, as well as how to ship properly with dry ice, um, how to ship properly with wet ice, any sort of materials you need to ship. Um, for the biological safety portion, um, this also goes in tandem with our risk assessment. Our risk assessment um, gets into sort of the risk groups and how the risk groups are defined, and then how our activities are defined in our risk assessment. So we're using that material that ABSA brought to us that said, these are sort of the risk group definitions, this is how we handle risk assessments, and um, this is how they would do it in a professional lab. And we said, well, that's great. This is how we do it in, you know, biocurious or counterculture or uh, biomix space. And we sort of brought those sort of things together and we said, well, we're not that far off. This is how we handle that. And we give you guidance around um, how to do those biosafety level um, and containment levels in your own lab. And then, um, what sort of experiments need to take place in the containment lab. So we talk about the biosafety level one lab facilities, and that goes hand in hand with lab design. And then we point out to um, the use of the biohazard symbol and things of the biosafety for human derived materials, animal cell materials, 
um, things like food projects, which are really hot, um, and environmental samples. So we sort of get into a lot of the minutia about um, subdividing these things. And as Todd pointed out earlier, we wanted to make sure you guys, um, we don't ask you to read it word for word, but we wanted to make this manual searchable. So if you have an issue or you're confused about policy, you can log on to the handbook, you can type in the search box, and then you can go directly to something that gives you the information you need, right? It either links you out to a place where you can find more information, or it helps you um, break down the information we've sort of summarized in a consumable way where you can say, oh, this is how this applies to my situation. So. Eric, I wanted to just jump in and say a couple of sure. things. Is that all right? Um, yeah, go ahead. The, the group here has been working on this for a grand total of three years. Um, so it's a, it's a long work in progress, um, but this is a living document. So we covered as much as we knew to cover but the ultimate goal of this is that we hand it over to the community and then the community spends the time to sort of upkeep it and then grow it um, and customize it as both the technologies change, but also as the communities change. And so, you know, the purpose of this meeting is to show what we've been able to do, but obviously this document will extend beyond the, the group of lab heads that have started to work on this pro project and then go into the community and, and allow for the community to build it as the community sees fit. So, you know, one of the big questions that we're asking in this session is how do we do that in an orderly, organized, functional way where we know that the material in this remains, uh, well, effectively safe um, and then, of course, covers the various different aspects of people's labs in different regions and then, of course, different environments from, you know, your, your home lab to the community lab to even, you know, outdoor research or outdoor uh, outreach events and things of that nature as well. Um, hey, Dan, I just wanted to jump in and say Jenny is here. So I wanted to give Jenny the chance to jump in and introduce herself and talk a little bit, a bit about um, uh, I think we did her chapters already, but, um, you know, Jenny, come say hi. Actually, we did not do her chapters yet. Oh, we didn't. So. Okay, well, Jenny, okay, there you go. <laughs> Jenny, we can't hear you. Sure. Mike's still here. Ah, an organizer needs to unmute her because she can't. Oh, sorry. I was trying to just do you, Jenny. Can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, excellent. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't unmute before. Sorry. Uh, yes. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jenny Malloy. I'm a research fellow at the University of Cambridge and was one of the authors of this document, but I've just zoomed across from a panel on open source DNA um, as there was a, a panelist dropout, so I filled in. So thank you <laughs> to the other organisers for it sounds like filling in on one of my sections, or maybe not. Um, so yeah, I, I worked on a few chapters within the biosafety handbook um, and I was intending to cover the, so we, we had a lot of generic um, information in there that's applicable across lots of different types of work, but we also recognize that there were some specific topics that really needed tackling in a bit more depth and so that's the sort of almost the, the penultimate four I guess um, in the list here so working with microbes animal safety plant biosafety and biosecurity in community labs we felt deserved chapters on their own um, and so to just briefly say I mean working with microbes uh, we're aware that this is basically the bread and butter of, of many community labs work and so this chapter just does a deep dive into um, different types of microbes and the specific kind of um, implications of working with bacteria working with yeast working with fungi things you might want to consider that goes a little bit beyond um, the standard biosafety protocols. It's a very chunky chapter. <laughs> There's a ton of information in there. So um, have fun. <laughs> and then animal safety and plant biosafety are a little bit more specific. Um, 
we I, I honestly on in writing this thought that animal safety would be a tiny chapter because the rules in the UK are so strict that it is really hard to use any animals so I signed up for that one thinking fantastic this is going to be a really easy job and then it turned out to not be the case because of course in many countries the definition of what is an animal for research purposes is somewhat broader um, and so we, we did tackle a, a lot of, um, of information in that chapter, but I think the, the kind of the overarching message is think really carefully before using any animals, even if it's insects. Um, obviously, there are, there are massive in, sort of considerations around ethics, considerations around welfare that need to be, need to be thought through extremely carefully before you start. Um, and so those are covered in some depth. We've done a little bit more detail on some of the types of animals that we think may be used in, in a lab context, in a community lab context. Context, which are largely insects um, so but we do mention um, other other types of animals but largely to explain some of the complications um, of dealing with them um, and in plant biosafety uh, that's more extra work on containment particularly if you're working with GM plants um, they do have seeds they have ways of spreading that are different to if you're working with a microbe for example and actually both animal and plant biosafety there's chat there's sort of to the chat sectors sections in there about what containment means in the context of GM animals and GM plants. Um, and then biosecurity, we tried to keep that um, as pragmatic and as useful in the community lab context as possible. So it's a reasonably short and concise chapter. You won't find it going to a whole bunch of kind of, you know, theory research or anything on biosecurity. It's a really, really useful list of things that you should consider. Um, in terms of community labs and, and a lot of the processes that you would have in place anyway, but just kind of how they link to biosecurity. And so hopefully that will be of interest for um, those of you working on specific projects um, or having people apply to work on particular projects in your labs that goes beyond the sort of standard, um, standard biosafety. Thank you very much. All right, so let me do a couple of the last sections there and I should mention we've already kind of had to add things to this because a number of us were involved in drafting the biosafety guidelines for uh, Juggle, just one giant lab that is doing tons of uh, COVID projects and we already had to cover things that were not covered in our biosafety manual that we just made, right? Things like how should you try and be careful about self-experimentation or what about developing medical devices, which we're not really covering in here. So yeah, there's, there's definitely tons of stuff that still need to be added to here. Um, I helped out with a number of the sections here. I'll just talk about outreach briefly. Um, what if you wanna take your science out of the lab? What if you wanna do a demo in a classroom? Uh, what are the issues with taking just like GFP E. coli into a classroom, even though, you know, if you read some of the rules strictly, all of that should be forbidden. Um, but, you know, high school teachers will buy G GMO E. coli from uh, online sources and use it in their labs every single day, pretty much. Um, so there's some interesting issues there. Uh, how do you take your project to a maker fair, for example, where you might have like little kids walking around, pulling things off your table and licking them? You know, <laughs> what are the kind of things you have to really think about? I mean, that's, that's all falls under outreach. Uh, these are quite realistic scenarios. We ha actually have had children grab things off our table and licking them. <laughs> Luckily, just like plastic stuff, not actually live cultures. So uh, anyway, um, any questions? There's so much in here. This really needs like several hours to go through the, the table of contents in, in any significant depth. We're just scratching the surface here for the moment. Yeah, I would love to do a round of questions about the table of contents and sort of if anyone wants to talk about what got covered, what you feel like maybe didn't and why, or if you have questions that haven't been answered before we move on. I think it would be great to do a round. Um, Desiree, can we unmute everyone so that people can or people can raise their hand. Sure. Um, so people can unmute themselves now to speak. So there's a question in the chat from uh, Krishna. Is there anything in here about ethics? So we specifically developed a biosafety handbook. So we don't really cover ethics much. 
Uh, there's a little bit of that here and there, but that was not the focus for this particular handbook. Right, we, we were sure to put the codes of ethics that came out uh, at the, in the early days of, of um, DIY bio, just so they're in the, in the manual. Um, but of course, and of course we've included the ones that were developed last year at BioSummit. Um, but I think this is still an open question and it, it didn't necessarily make sense for us to go in, in, in depth in that area. But definitely when we're talking about like self-experimentation, you know, there's a very strong ethical defense of, of doing that, even though the biosafety officers might cringe about it. And just to say that this, that's a good sort of plug for, for Sarah Ware's um, event right after this one, where she's going to be talking about, you know, IRBs, which are, I would argue, a little more focused on some of the ethical questions. But this is a question, a big question that I think the community needs to discuss amongst itself about the, those boundaries between safety, ethics, and security, and where we want to come out on, and what kinds of guidances um, we need or don't need, um, or shouldn't even attempt to do. I think that's a, a conversation this community needs to, to have moving forward. And, and, just and definitely clear, some yeah. of the other sessions in this track, uh, the DIY IRB and some of these other discussions, uh, we'd love to tie in with those a lot more as well. Yeah, yeah thanks. Thanks I, for the plug, guys. Uh, please come for 345 to the IRB talks. Continue this, thanks. So I, I love the discussion everyone's talking about. Um, where and how the governance of this project is going to work. And we're going to get into that later of how we, we want the community to take this over and how they believe is best to fork it or move on to editing this. Um, we'll cover that. Yeah, so we're about to do some breakout sessions, um, but you know, just in case anyone wanted to, um, you know, we'll do some breakout sessions for this track, but you know, if there are specific questions about the content of the handbook. Yeah, and, and to answer Justice's question, so Justice, there are ethical frameworks that do shape safety policies. Um, um, HIPAA is definitely one of them, um, and the NIH has a couple of directives on biosafety and biosecurity that they get into with um, human experimentation, but I really think it's best to leave that to people developing the ethics. So, um, do we want to move to the next slide where we start to ask some of those governance questions? I don't know who's actually in control of the slides. Todd's, it's Todd's computer. <laughs> Todd, you're in charge of the slides. Go two forward. Can you see them? Does it not say what kinds of knowledge and resources? Nope. No. We're still on the introduction slide. Oh. You know, Todd, you might have to unshare and then share again. Okay. There you go. Yay. <laughs> Great. And you'll see that the header there is straight from our uh, shared purpose that we developed over the past two years. Cultivate an accessible commons of knowledge and resources. That's exactly what we're doing here. And uh, I just took some of the uh, questions that actually came out of the, the governance exercise that we did yesterday at the end of the plenary session. Uh, if, for those of you that were involved in that, um, sort of things like what should this document really include? I mean, right now, we don't cover anything that's specifically geared towards the grinder community, for example. Should this biosafety handbook include how to safely, you know, perform your own surgery to insert uh, magnets in your fingertips? You know, is that within the scope of what we're doing here? Those are the kind of questions that really the community should be answering, not just, you know, the seven of us. Right. Uh, Go ahead. Dan. Yeah, I just, I, you know, I think the bigger, the question that we need to decide is what, how does this thing live on in a, in a meaningful way? You know, in my imaginary, I, I see a committee coming together from this community 
to take responsibility from this doc for this document. I think there's a big question about whether we have one document or many documents that are edited separately. I'm trying to hold my opinion back, so I won't say what I think. Um, but you know, these are questions that really are posed to, to the community. And I think the best way to figure it out about how to keep this thing as a useful tool for all of us is us to figure out one, you know, how often is this edited? Who's editing it? How are they editing it? Uh, where does it live? Right now it's living as a Google Doc because you know why? Because Google Doc is right now the most convenient way to have it. But it might be more useful as a wiki or on some other platform. That's going to be up to you guys and, and whoever decides they want to be on this, commu this committee. So one thing that Todd shared at the beginning of all of this chat was a, a sign-up sheet where if you're interested in being uh, involved in that decision-making process, um, sign up. Uh, it's the only way that we're going to form a committee that's basically lasting and has a proper way to, to maintain and keep this as a useful tool to everyone. Um, before we go into the next session, I guess we're going right into um, sort of uh, group, group discussions. Um, you know, here are some of these, these questions that were, were discussed. We're going to go into group sessions and we're going to basically have two sets of um, lines of, of questions that we're going to try to answer within the groups. I think the one that's important is, um, you know, how we're going to govern this, how are, we, how are we going to maintain this? And then the second are the, some of the other questions that Patrick raised, which is what belongs in this book? or what belongs in this manual? Where does this manual belong? How do we promote this manual? How do we make sure that folks are finding the resources through this ma manual that is useful to them, so local to them, um, and so on and so forth. Um, does anyone wanna ask questions about that or does any of the other presenters wanna talk about um, something from their perspective? I'll just say from a, a practical standpoint is that um, these types of resources can quickly die or quickly become um, useless. In a, that's a harsh term, but like can quick, and something along this, like Patrick was mentioning before, that it does actually need to be updated. And we know that we're missing things, particularly from different regions of the world where things like transport of samples are different than they are here in the US. And so there's important things that still need to be updated into this manual. And so we do need like the community to, to step up and, and you know what was discussed yesterday that there needs to be some ownership and people taking leads on these things in order for this to, to continue. Um, and even as something as simple as where it should live um, maybe seems like a simple thing, but it's actually not. Um, because if we choose a platform that has, that costs money, for instance, we then have to figure out where those resources are coming from so it doesn't disappear if, you know, we don't pay the web hosting bill, for instance. Um, so these are the types of things that we, we need the community to help with because like we each, each of seven of us have our own individual sort of ideas of what that should be potentially, but that it's not for us to decide that. Um, and we want the community to, to really be the ones that sort of take this now to the, to the next step. Um, so those are the types of things that um, we'd like to start that conversation today in these breakout groups. Um, but at the very least, we would like, you know, people to use that sign up sheet so we can begin to get um, you know, some leaders that are going to, you know, take this, this, this forward so we know that, you know, it's, it's not going to sort of die on the vine, so to speak. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just see this as a, a really fantastic resource that this community has never had before. And it, it's something that we can grow as a community with and it can grow with us. Um, and so this is sort of our moment. Um, yeah, and these, these decisions will have to be made 
through, through the people who are here today. So thank you everyone for joining us for this. And, and, and please help broaden our perspective because we all came from it sort of from a, a you know, a fairly classic biosafety perspective, even though we're all involved with community labs. Uh, but we can definitely use a wider range of voices involved in this. And, and don't forget, we don't all agree with each other. And, and a lot of these <laughs> portions we've argued through um, and some of these questions basically were left, left to you, you, the community, to, to really think it through. And let me just reinforce what um, I think Angela said in the beginning, that, that these are sort of like starting point recommendations. And, and one thing I want to point out is this relationship that we have with APSA is that they, um, you know, they are really, you know, in some weird way, excited about helping us with this. And they actually can help us and help you figure out how to like hack the safety protocol, right? To really make sure that you're sort of meeting what the purpose of that protocol was, knowing that you're not gonna necessarily be able to do it in a traditional way. Um, and so they've expressed the ways, you know, to help, help us sort of figure that out. And so I would say like, you know, these are the types of things, like if you have a completely weird looking space, which is great, right? A lot of these things might not look like they fit for how you do things. And so those are the, also the types of sort of, you know, experiences that you've had to also be able to help sort of, you know, expand this, this resource as well. And I have actually been very pleasantly surprised in working with APSA. Uh, they have been tremendous. I, I, I have to admit, I sort of had this character of a biosafety officer in the back of my mind as somebody who's going to say no when you come up with something interesting, right? <laughs> and that, that's totally not what they do. They're all about, let's go back to basic principles and figure out how can we make this safe within your conditions, right? What is your local context, sort of? How do we have to modify these rigid rules that we have put down in black and white, right? Um, I wanted to just check how we are on time because I know we wanted to do some breakouts and that was going to be 25 minutes. Um, and then we still wanted to report back. Is that right? Yeah, so it's about time to break out. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've got 42 um, participants in this room, which is awesome. Um, and six of those are people who were members of the team that co-authored this. So we were thinking about um, maybe doing six breakout rooms. Does that sound good? Desiree, is that, okay. is that, is that good? Let's do it. Yes. So yes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm about to click a magic button. And when that happens, Everyone is going to automatically get assigned to one breakout rooms one through six and hold on just a moment when that happens because there's a chance that a couple of the leads may end up in the same room and then I'm quickly going to flip them over to a breakout room so things are even. So just um, give me a moment here. This should be the quick way to do it. But And before, we'll, before we do that, let's mm -hmm. outline the rules of the road. So every okay. group will have to assign at least one person who's actually taking notes, right? Uh, and what is the range of topics we will be discussing in the breakout rooms? Have we, do we have a set list or do yes, we? Yes, uh... we do. There are Google Docs for each breakout group, which is in, the, if you go into the master Google Doc that Alex just posted and scroll down to breakout groups, there'll be breakout group one, two, three, four, five, and six, <laughs> all have a Google Doc and they all have the same list of topics in them. So hopefully we're not going to go too far um, off track. Okay. And we'll know what number we are in. Apparently, Zoom will tell you a number, we hope. Yes, Zoom, Zoom will tell you because it's going to go automatic, and then I'm going to try to quickly move leads. All right. And okay. then we, when we get back, there will be a report out. So maybe figure out who among you wants to actually report back to the, the bigger group. All right, let's do, um, let's do some really quick report backs. Um, okay, so I am the designated reporter for group six, but um, who are groups one through five? Uh, I am Wendy for one. Hi, Wendy. Okay, you can go first. You're one. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, let me just make sure I have our notes. So um, 
In talking about governing and managing the biosafety handbook, um, we discussed that, uh, you know, a committee seems to be a, a very good approach. Then we talked about, you know, who would serve on that and, you know, how diverse does that committee need to be in terms of knowledge, expertise, and perspectives? Um, Can everyone mute if you're not? We also talked about the vertical structure of that, like, you know, as many re voices represented at many levels, including outsiders and, you know, a general community member, uh, technical members, med students, grinders. Um, then we talked about the different perspectives that you have to have, like the gray side of legal. Um, and uh, that there, we also uh, talked about the, you know, things we'd like to see added is uh, chapters on self-experimentation as that becomes increasingly popular, uh, especially in light of vaccines. Um, you know, how do we provide a network of folks that would provide resources for, you know, people that are interested in biohacking. Uh, then we talked about, you know, the structure of the, the committee as far as uh, having sort of some sort of rotation of members and term limits. Maybe it's a year to a two, two year term. Um, what are the roles on the committee? Who would be different expertise? Um, and, you know, who would be selected to that committee? And so would there be endorsements, uh, for example, archive style, where, you know, individuals could be endorsed by other community members and that's how they would be selected for the committee. Then we talked about, uh, you know, how is the handbook gonna be edited? How comfortable are the uh, individuals who started it with forking? Uh, segments yeah. across different prongs, the potential for contradictory information and how to deal with that and how to make sure that every really can find good safety advice quickly. We then also talked about how many times to do this committee should meet. It seemed reasonable that it would meet quarterly. Then we talked about whether that maybe should be one day or uh, maybe spread out over a week with uh, members having some ability to chat. <laughs> Um, Can everyone mute if you're coming in the room, please? And we talked about maybe uh, those quarterly meetings tying in with other things like BioSummit or uh, ABSA, pairing it with that. Um, and uh, let's see. Hey, Wendy, I'm actually going to have to cut you off. And okay, move on nope. to the next group. I'm sorry. <laughs> let's keep it because we that still want to have a break it. before the next one. But I appreciate that. That's wonderful. That um, just make sure we're, you know, make sure you finish any thoughts you have on your dog for sure. Okay, Ryan, you're on. All right, I am Ryan from group two. So we had discussed essentially, first of all, the document is amazing. It's great. Thank you everyone for putting it together. Um, it's also huge and it's much more than a biosafety handbook. We discussed perhaps it could be broken up into different things. One for biosafety, one for administrative and startup guides to community labs. There was a lot of good discussion about that. We're not sure the right answer there. Um, but it is it's something to think about and especially a different name if it does stay as one document Perhaps a new name so it does show that it's more than biosafety to be more enticing for people to dive in We also had the same concern about forking and what's going to happen if every community lab is hosting it on their own website How do people know what is the official most up-to-date version? So we need to have some thoughts around that maybe some clearly identified date times and stamps or version numbers so people know what the most official one is and also when it comes to forking there could be some valid reasons for that in terms of regional guides but perhaps those could be put in as addendums for various countries or states with various regulations so that people can jump right to their section and we're also going to need to think about translation as well to make sure that this gets to the widest audience possible um, so those are the main things that we thought about i, I think that's covers most of it. As far as the governance structure, um, it was suggested by me to at least have this reviewed formally once a year for updates. I think the meetings should happen more common to that, just so everyone's on the same page. And also that there could be immediate changes for anything pressing that happens, and that those should at least be open to public comment, if nothing else. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, Natalia, group three. Let's keep it to let's keep it to a minute and Thank 30 you. seconds each because we still want to have a break, you guys. Thank perfect, you. Perfect. Do you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Hi, Natalia. 
Hi, so from group three, we, we were talking also about regarding governance that uh, there is a need for creating some kind of space that allows for curation in the information that is going to be added to the document so that there could be comments and suggestions from the community openly, but that they are filtered somehow by some kind of committee that uh, uh, guards the, the, the safety um, measures and the suggestions are put it into the handbook finally. And there we also discussed that uh, how often this should be updated. Um, we commented that it could be annually to, to kind of consider uh, to adapt to changing reg regulations or to the technology breakthroughs, but at the same time, it could be more often to consider like faster changes within the community or, or needs or, or events. Um, also, uh, regarding promoting how to promote this biosafety handbook, uh, we were talking about like considering uh, other communities that are closely related to the biomakers community, like FabLearn or others, uh, also associations that could be hosting many of uh, these individuals that are uh, involved in such kind of activities like um, like specific field associations. I mentioned personally all biotech, which I know from the Latin American community. So, so such kind of associations could help to also spread the word about this new handbook. And finally, awesome. maybe just okay, one more last thing, comments. we're gonna move on to Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. Very fast. It was very interesting that we, we also commented that it could add, uh, like the document could have a, could include also some in illustrations or even have a comic yeah. format for some younger, uh, younger communities or, and so on. Uh, I think I'll leave it there to not make it longer. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much, Natalia. I love that. Illustrations. Yes. Um, Sarah. Okay. It's you. Yeah, so basically we don't want it on GitHub. Um, we unanimously did not want it on GitHub. We, we do want it as a Google Doc. Um, we were talking about also, it was mentioned by at least two of the other groups to do, to save um, versions, like version one, version two, version three, so that we can see where it's been, like maybe yearly. Um, archive those and then I mean basically I think that was mostly we don't really care maybe at this point we didn't discuss too much about where to promote it maybe Facebook Instagram I don't know the usual suspects and I think that was mostly ours we also thought it was really long it's really great but it's really long and so there were suggestions to maybe summarize the most important parts of each <laughs> Um, section and things like that. But um, if no one else in my group has anything, I think we leave ours there. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, um, who is group five? Hi. Um, yeah, we talked about many of the same things, term limits. Um, I think one of the things that would be helpful is a, is a written description of what the expectations are for the steering committee members and a contract that they're like, yes, I'm committing to these things. Um, we talked about the notion of like multiple different types of steering committees, including um, some that weren't explicitly called out in the like in the form. So things like art, graphic design, social media events, um, possibly possibly for specific subject matters like animal use, um, youth policies, things like that. Um, and then we talked a lot about whether or not this was supposed to be like a chartered doc that people are saying yes, these are the things that I agree to in my lab versus like a a, a, a handbook that is intended to be like flexible and use case oriented. Um, so there was a little bit of discussion of what, like what's the point of this doc, like what role does it serve? Um, and then we talked about GitHub uh, and also like having some sort of code of conduct for making updates and making suggestions. So having all of that explicitly laid out ahead of time. Um, and then in terms of um, promotion, um, Maria mentioned that there might be opportunities for partnerships that like a, a foundation or a, a research lab or some other organization focused on safety might be willing to, to financially sponsor the trainings, especially since they'd be virtual, online, low cost, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then Raphael mentioned that many labs are just waiting for this to happen. So promotion will happen very naturally because people like want this. <laughs> um, so that'll be an easy, an easy option. Um, and then again, last thing to emphasize the like the the intentionality of like this being a diverse community of users, the artists, designers, 
uh, creators, the, the podcasters, like we have those folks in our world. And so like, let's use their talents to help with the promotion. Love that. Thank you, Beth. Um, okay, I'll just do really quickly group six. Um, so we talked about many of the same things that have been mentioned here. Um, we were a little bit more flexible about the idea of forking um, and having different versions, especially for um, different contexts, specifically regional ones. We thought that it might be interesting to see how the biosafety handbook develops as different regions um, evolve their biosafety regulations and how different contexts might evolve different versions of the book. Um, and especially as like this community um, gets stronger and stronger in, um, in, as regional groups, um, that that's going to be really interesting. Um, and I'll just say, since most of the other stuff was also mentioned, um, that we also did uh, mention that it would be interesting to have more um, attention on health interventions, both for um, augmentation and uh, therapeutic interventions in the grinder community or, you know, looking at what Joggle is doing, that that needs to be updated and that that's a really interesting way that some folks in this community might make their knowledge more useful, but that also um, the liability issue with the medical professionals giving advice for um, non-medical enhancements is one that still needs to be approached delicately, um, but that may be there could be more outreach with those kinds of professionals to give safety advice the same way that biosafety professionals have contributed to this volume. 